Hello. Good morning, Copenhagen. This is Ingrid Pilla coming to you from Sydney in Australia. And I'm delighted to be able to share some reflections on the politics of migrant language learning with you today. I'm speaking to you from more than 16,000 kilometers away. And my research has mostly been in Australia, which may seem a long way away from Denmark and in a very different research context. However, migration is a big issue in both contexts. OECD data, first generation immigrants account for around 5% of students in Scandinavian schools and the children of immigrants, the so-called second generation, account for another 5 to 10%. In Australia, these figures are slightly higher and sit around 12% for both um, first and second generation, meaning that a quarter of all students in Australia have a migrant background. The somewhat higher figures in Australia reflect a longer migration history and the fact that migration has been part of Australia's national identity since the end of World War II. In short, migration and with it the linguistic diversity it engenders is a demographic reality both in Scandinavia and in Australia and indeed across the OECD and beyond. In addition to the commonality of the fact of migration, there is another commonality, the politization of language and migration contexts. The language related aspects of migration are politicized in Denmark. By a recent blog post on language on the move by Marta Karabek. Hi, Marta. In the post entitled Fences, Language and Education, Marta cites one of your politicians, Inga Stober, stating the obvious. In Denmark, we speak Danish. The statement was made to argue against heritage language teaching in schools. Like so many politicians internationally, Stober claims language as the terrain of politics. To give you some more examples, just south of the Danish swine fence, Marty made headlines in 2015 when they insisted that German was not only the language of public life in Germany, but should also be the language of all homes in the country. Foreigners have to speak German at home. That's what the headline says here. In Britain, the supposed beacon of liberalism, there are demands to force migrants to learn English with the ominous plan to track down non-English speaking people and force them to learn the language. How exactly you would force someone to learn a language is not specified and I think too gruesome to contemplate. Australia, our local context here, embraced multiculturalism in the 1980s and has come only recently to the party. But in 2018, Australia caught up with Europe and our conservative government discovered, just like its European counterparts, that there are political points to be scored if you make migrant language learning a matter of political debate. They attempted to make English language proficiency a visa requirement and we saw lots of headlines like this one proclaiming speak English or no visa. By way of context, I should say that um, the vast majority of migrants to Australia come in the skilled migrant category, which involves a point system. And so our migrants have fairly high levels of English language proficiency already on arrival because um, it's a visa requirement. The only visa categories that do not have a language requirements are family reunion and humanitarian entrance visas. Additionally, there is the obvious fact, a fact that will be very obvious to you in Scandinavia, although it is often lost on our politicians here in Australia, the fact that English is the most widely learned language on the planet. While migrants to Denmark, to Finland, to Norway, Sweden may indeed not have had much of a language learning opportunity prior to entering the country, this is of course vastly different in, um, 
Anglophone countries, as you will appreciate. However, these facts are easily lost when it comes to the politics of migrant language learning. The fear that migrants are not learning the destination language is as much a political football in the English-speaking world as it is in countries with smaller or less widely taught languages. In Australia, the fear has a number, one million. One million is big, not only when you spell it all in capitals. Certainly much bigger than 4% which is what 1 million amounts to in a population of 25 million. The language panic around migrants' failure to learn English that unfolded in Australia last year was mostly propelled by three groups. First, members of the Conservative Party who hold government. Second, members of a small but vocal right-wing party. And third, the right-wing Murdoch media empire. together propelled a language panic about migrants' failure to learn English. The language panic made one central claim, that large numbers of migrants do not learn English. This claim was undergirded by two assumptions. First, that not speaking English is a matter of personal choice. And second, that speaking a language other than English or um, load for short here on the slide, is cause for suspicion. As linguists, we know that both these assumptions are deeply flawed. Language choice is mostly a result of habit and proficiency. Language choice is specific to the context and the domain. While language choice may sometimes be guided by the desire to conceal, to exclude and to conspire, this is actually relatively rare. We can challenge the first assumption with even greater certainty. We know that the outcomes of adult language learning are not, or not even primarily, a matter of personal choice. We know that the context of reception plays a crucial role and it's true of learner variables, such as age, prior education, socioeconomic status, aptitude, gender, or even sheer luck, and so on and so forth. I won't go into the details of um, adult language learning here. I've written quite a bit about it. And for those of you who want a quick refresher, you can find one here under the URL on language on the move in a post about the real problem with linguistic shirkers. The real problem as I argue there, is not in fact the individual language learner, but rather the context of reception. It is particularly pernicious when that context is one of rejection of migrants and permeated by a discourse that construes language learning as a matter of personal responsibility. Such a discourse in effect amounts to victim blaming as it blames language learners for aspects of their language learning over which they have no control. This means that the politicization of migrant language learning creates real barriers to social inclusion. As such, it is a discourse we must engage as researchers and as educators. How can we best do that? engage? What is our role when it comes to the politicization of migrant language learning and engagement with it to be deeply flawed? During the 2018 language panic in Australia that I spoke about earlier, I undertook a lot of media engagement. I wrote a series of articles for the conversation um, on newspaper, you, academic kind of newspaper you may be familiar with in Europe, which attempted to set the record straight. Um, I wrote about the factors at play in adult language learning and the article you see here about the time it takes to learn another language, make the claim that one million migrants to Australia do not speak, a do not speak English. 
As far as the popularity of academic linguists and their media engagement goes, those articles were highly successful. They were widely read on the conversation, they were republished by major national and even international media outlets, and they garnered me a fair number of radio interviews. After a few months of intense media engagement, I felt pretty exhausted. But had I actually changed anyone's understanding of migrant language learning? Unfortunately, I'm not particularly optimistic. In fact, I've had to conclude that those who politicize migrant language learning for their own political gain do not wish to be convinced otherwise. And for everyone else, the claim of a politician who knows nothing about language learning still rings much louder and more convincing than the considered opinion and research of researchers in the field. The fact check in particular left me rather disillusioned because I felt it conceded the terms of the debate. While the number of 1 million non-speakers of English in Australia is certainly too high, the precise number is ultimately irrelevant. It is irrelevant because it accepts that language learning is an individual responsibility and that those who do not succeed to learn the dominant language to a particular and usually arbitrary standard are not worthy of living in our country. As such, engaging with the politicization of migrant language learning on the terms of the debate set by politicians with ulterior motives, as I did last year, cannot achieve much as, it, as long as it fails to challenge what Marta Karabek has referred to as a severely limited imagination when it comes to multilingualism and cultural diversity. The discursive means to imagine cultural, ethnic and linguistic diversity differently are currently lacking. So how can we shift the terms of the debate and expand the limited imagination around multilingualism and linguistic diversity? Let me try another tack and move away from the abstract debate around migrant language learning. Let's see what blanket statements such as in Australia we speak English or in Denmark we speak Danish actually mean in people's lives. Let me introduce three Australians to you. Maria Nicheforo, Vinyesh Varatharaj and Marcia Rahimi. I feel that their stories are shocking and some images on the slides are graphic. Let's begin with Maria Nietzsche. Maria died in 2014 when she was 75 years old from infected pressure wounds. The wounds were found to be contaminated with her excrement and the dentures in her mouth had not been cleaned in months and had collected mold. During the inquest into her death, it emerged that Maria, who had come to Australia from Italy in her 20s and did not speak much English in her old age, had difficulty communicating with her carers. In particular, the carers reported that Maria had refused to follow their instructions and that she was not cooperating with her treatment plan. They described her, and I quote, as stubborn. That there might be a better way to secure Maria's cooperation in her care plan than speaking to her in a language that she did not understand seems not to have occurred to anyone. Mm -hmm. On to Vinesh Varatharaj. Vinesh was a worker in a chemical waste disposal facility that went up in flames last year and covered Melbourne in toxic smoke for a number of days. During the inquest into the industrial accident, it emerged that the factory exclusively employed workers from Sri Lanka who were in Australia on temporary work visas and spoke limited English. Workers such as Vinesh, who was badly burnt during the accident, were aware of the dangerous conditions and practices in the factory. However, 
They were unaware of Australian occupational health and safety legislation, and they did not have access to the right channels to get their concerns heard by the authorities or to lodge a complaint. Their lack of English language proficiency was one aspect of their overall vulnerability. Had information and reporting channels in Tamil been available, an industrial accident which negatively impacted hundreds of thousands of people could have been avoided. Let's meet Marcia Rahimi who in 2007 was strangled to death by her husband in their Melbourne home. In the weeks leading up to her murder, Marcia had twice called triple zero, that's Australia's emergency hotline. In both cases, the phone call was aborted before a diary interpreter could be brought into the conversation. On neither occasion was there a callback attempt, nor was a police car dispatched to her address. During her husband's murder trial, the judge asked how emergency, service, how emergency services could be improved to break down the barrier created by limited ability to communicate in English for women such as Marcia to receive support. Since then, more attention is being paid to ensure better access for um, domestic violence victims to support services and particularly for women um, from non-English speaking backgrounds. So what do the stories of Maria Vignesh and Marcia, stories about social problems resulting from the simplistic assertion that in Australia we speak English or in Denmark we speak Danish, what do these stories mean for the way we understand language in migrant societies? What do they mean for our engagement with the politicization of migrant language learning? It seems to me that the linguist's conviction that linguistic diversity is inherently a good thing is not enough to make a claim on resources. Asserting that linguistic diversity is a good thing in the abstract is relatively weak as it just pits one claim against another. The claim of the national language versus a diffuse ideal of multilingualism. I argue that we need to shift our attention away from language to social participation. The way to expand our severely limited imagination when it comes to multilingualism and cultural diversity is not actually on the terrain of language and national identity at all. It is on the terrain of aged care, industrial safety and domestic violence and all the other social domains where there is broad agreement that the principles of prevention of harm and equitable access should apply for the common good in the interest of all members of society. So what does shifting the debate from language to social participation mean for us? What does it mean linguistically? The best evidence that we have and which I assembled in my 2016 book Linguistic Diversity and Social Justice relates to multilingual service provision and language learning. Availability of public service communications in languages other than English or Danish, Finnish, Norwegian or Swedish is essential, as is access to interpreter services. has had federally funded multilingual service provision since the 1980s. And while much remains to be done, we know that multilingual service provision is feasible. For recent migrants and those who cannot gain access otherwise, it is a right and it is our democratic responsibility. At the same time that we need multilingual service provision, there is no doubt that proficiency in the dominant language for all is preferable to translated and interpreter mediated communication. This entails significant investment in language learning, but not only on the part of migrants. To begin with, 
Adult migrants who arrive without sufficient proficiency need to be supported in their language learning. That means not only availability of language classes, but also accessibility, free of charge, in the neighborhood, in workplaces, with childcare provision, and so on. Second, as a society, we need to invest in the home language maintenance of the second generation. Not because of idealistic notions about heritage languages, but because of self-interest. Strong families are the st basis of a strong society. Today's children will be the multilingual mediators of the future. And security in their dual identities also seems a good protection against radicalization. Finally, language learning is not only the challenge of newcomers. Old timers need to share the communicative burden too. It doesn't have to be full on language learning for everyone. The research by Tracy Durbing and her colleagues in Canada has shown that a little training in what a particular accent sounds like. Vietnamese and Arabic accented English in their research. So what this kind of English looks like actually can go a really long way to improving intergroup relationships. Wrap up and recap. As linguists and edu educators, we are naturally focused on language. The politicization of language means we are confronted with a lot of talk about language that seems ill-informed and misguided, and it's very tempting to wade into the fray. However, what is, ac what is actually a legitimate counterclaim to the notion that in Australia we speak English or in Denmark we speak Danish? But we'd prefer a diverse and multilingual Australia or Denmark? That is ultimately little more than a debate about taste and preferences. The way forward is different. The way forward is to go away from the terrain of language and to reframe the debate. It is not about language, but about the social consequences of language. Ultimately, language is a social justice issue. Our contribution as researchers and educators must be to examine where and how language is a social justice issue and what less harmful linguistic arrangements look like. Thank you so much for your attention and I'll be looking forward to your questions. <laughs>